Hello everybody, welcome back to uh, Indie Car. Today is the oh, Wednesday the 18th of September, so it's not long to go now before um, Boris's prorogation ends, another four weeks to wait uh, until Parliament sits again, or will it? Because I uh, remember that Joanna Cherry's uh, recent court, <coughs> court action, her appeal, uh, is being re-examined by the English Supreme Court this week, in fact in progress as we speak. Now one of the weird things about this process is that <clears throat> there are actually three appeals being supposedly judged by the Supreme Court justices um, of the English Supreme Court, which means that there is a case from Scotland, a case from London and a case from Northern Ireland all being looked at by these judges. The case from Scotland at first was, um, was thrown out and then on appeal it was won. So, the Scottish Court of Session judges have decided that Boris Johnson's actions in suspending Parliament were illegal. And that now has to go to the Supreme Court for them to have a look at it to decide what the overall overview um, legally is in um, the rest of the UK. So it's a bizarre situation because, as you're probably aware, there are only two laws in the United Kingdom. There is Scottish law and there is English law, or Scots law as we, we tend to call it. Scots law and English law were distinct and they were kept separate by the um, by the Acts of Union in 1707. One of the conditions of the Union set by the Scottish side was that Scots law would remain supreme in Scotland in perpetuity regardless of the Acts of Union or not. And so that means that whatever case is brought under Scots law to the Scottish Supreme Court, which is basically the Court of Session, and its inner house, which is what happened, that means that that judgment, um, if it has to be held in the United Kingdom so-called Supreme Court, actually has to be held in Scots law, and that Scots law has to be applied by the 11 judges in the Supreme Court. This is one of the strange things about it. English law can't apply to this appeal because the appeal was originally granted under Scots law. And that means any judge in England who's looking at this fresh and deciding whether to support this appeal um, with a, a Supreme Court ruling, that judge has to then look at this in terms of Scots law, not English law, not the, the Queen's law or whatever you want to call it in England. That cannot be applied to this case. And this is one of the reasons why I think Joanna Cherry, when she was interviewed yesterday, was cautiously optimistic that the English Supreme Court would actually find in favour of this appeal. In other words, the successful appeal in Scotland might be upheld by the Supreme Court simply because uh, Scots law applies to it. And three Scottish judges had already decided that Boris Johnson had acted illegally because of his motivation in suspending Parliament for such a long period of time. And also that that would set some kind of precedent for the future where any Prime Minister might be able to shut down Parliament for months or even years if he didn't like what the opposition was saying. And that would constitute an elected dictatorship in the UK, something which most people in the United Kingdom would be shocked uh, and repelled by because this is not um, this is not the democracy that has been sold to us time and time again uh, by the British state. We, we allegedly have the mother of all parliaments, the mother of democracies, and yet this is actually not the case. So if the case failed and the judges said that the appeal would fall under their judgment, then that would mean that 11 English Supreme Court judges were basically saying that Scots law was not good enough uh, to judge the Prime Minister's actions. And that would create another constitutional crisis. The English case is slightly different, uh, and it's been brought um, in London uh, for the same sort of reasons. And that was thrown out by the English courts as being not within their jurisdiction. In other words, they thought it was too political and there was no legal, uh, English legal um, sort of element to it that could be applied. The Irish case is a bit different because um, in Ireland, I think it's three survivors or survivors' families of the Troubles, people whose family members were killed or injured by bombs or bullets, um, they have launched a campaign uh, against the British government on Brexit. In other words, Brexit 
is going to destroy the Northern Ireland peace process uh, by trampling over the the, um, the uh, Belfast Agreement. And they think that this is a unconstitutional and illegal as well. So there's another court action. So Boris is being hit from three sides here. The question at the moment is, will the Scottish case hold up? Um, personally, I think it will because it was the appeal was upheld by three uh, High Court judges, three Scottish Supreme Court judges, if you like, who all said the same thing. Boris Johnson's motivation for suspending Parliament at Westminster was not to prepare uh, for a Queen's speech, but was to sideline all criticism and to deflect all scrutiny away from him while he ran the clock down to a no-deal Brexit. And I think we all know that Boris is wasting time waiting for a no-deal Brexit. OK, second uh, piece of, um, not, not exactly news, but I, I suppose comment, you might say. Adam Tompkins, well-known Scottish Tory, uh, and Murdo Fraser, also well-known Scottish Tory. Both of these men have been making absolutely outrageous, ridiculous and preposterous assertions that somehow or other they can force the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government to put preconditions on any new independence referendum. They are saying, um, I mean, Adam Tompkins is a, a comedian himself, I think. He's saying that basically that there's going to be a change of question, that he's going to make sure that it's either vote leave or vote remain. He has no power to do that. Murdo Fraser steps in and claims uh, that there has to be a two-thirds majority in favour of independence. Murdo Fraser has no power to make any such assertion, and he has absolutely no clout in Scotland at all. The Tories have... 12% or maybe even less than that now of the vote uh, in any Scottish election and they have only got the representation they have in Holyrood because many of their members got through on the so-called list vote system and this is the consolation seats that are given to parties who couldn't win a seat in first past the post. Murdo Fraser for example has never won a seat in his life. Uh, he has always been given this wooden spoon prize of a seat because um, his party and the Labour Party designed the electoral system to ensure that they would always have seats, even if they were terrible. So, the upshot of all of this is that neither Tompkins nor uh, Murdo Fraser can make any such claim at all. They can't put preconditions on any independence referendum. Only the Scottish Parliament will be able to do that after the referendums bill has finished its passage through Holyrood and has been approved. After that, Referendums will always be legal. The questions will be set by agreement with Parliament, not by Adam Tompkins and not by Murdo Fraser. No matter how hard they try to pretend otherwise, they cannot change any question or condition of a referendum without the full uh, debate and agreement of all of Holyrood. And that means a full majority in Holyrood behind any changes. I don't think the Tories have got anything like that amount of support in the chamber. Uh, and finally, uh, what was my subject for finally today? Oh yes, ah, um, there was an article written uh, yesterday, and I'm trying to think where I saw it. I think it was actually on the Russia Today sort of printed website, if you like. And this was an article um, by a man called, I think his name was Tom White, a journalist. and. Uh, and he, he wrote an article which basically said in 2014 he campaigned against independence. He didn't believe it was the right thing for Scottish people. He thought it was uh, too dangerous, too risky and all the rest of it. Uh, and now he's writing that he's entirely changed his mind. He said Brexit has completely torn up the United Kingdom and replaced it with this bizarre uh, Brexit land that nobody recognises from before 2014. What was promised and what we now have are completely different. He's now throwing his weight behind independence completely uh, and he's even in his writing now um, online, he, he had written for the Huffington Post, he'd written for The Independent, he's now writing bits and pieces for RT and other uh, news outlets. He now is basically campaigning for independence and he believes that he's not alone, he thinks there are a lot more converts uh, than we realise. Not only that though, he made an interesting comment which I think is worth repeating. We all saw the, um, the ugly scenes, or we heard about the ugly scenes, when a Republican march was set upon by an ambush of loyalist thugs recently. And because of this, um, 
the city council, Glasgow City Council, was forced to ban all forms of sectarian marches uh, over the last week or so. So six marches were banned, five loyalist marches and one republican march, because those were the ones which had been booked for that time. Not because they were having a go at the loyalists, but because they just happened to have arranged lots and lots and lots of marches. So, what this guy White was saying was that in the event that we obtain our independence in, in the way that we're hoping to do with a, a, a legal vote, that will cut off the support that these loyalist thugs rely on and this sectarian divide which has been inserted into Scottish society by the British state to keep us divided will lose all of the support it currently has from the union flag waving and Brexit cheerleaders of um, the Tory party and the far right in England who are happily stirring up sectarian violence in Scotland in order to try to stop any independence from happening by uh, presumably by getting marches banned completely or simply by causing trouble at marches by turning up and be, you know starting violent unrest <clears throat> This is a tactic which the British state has used before, and in most of the colonial countries where it was kicked out, it tried to divide uh, those countries along either racial lines or religious lines. It did so in India by dividing India and Pakistan and partitioning the country. It did so in India by dividing the country along religious lines as well, with Muslims on one side, Hindus on the other. It has a long history of this kind of thing. But what White says is right, independence will chop the legs from under the loyalist community and remove that vocal support from south of the border that they rely on in order to sustain them. They will eventually wither and die because there just will not be the support for it anymore. Uh, not only that, but when Scotland is independent, the reason for the existence of the likes of the Orange Order and these other loyalist organisations will disappear with them. And the fact that um, Northern Ireland might be uh, about to reunify with the South of Ireland will remove the need for Republican marches as well in Scotland in answer to this. So, in a way, Brexit, although it creates these huge problems, may provide uh, a platform to actually secure an answer to these sectarian issues and maybe just close them down forever. They may be vocal, they might argue, they might swear a lot, they might get cross and annoyed, and they might march about and stomp around and look miserable, but that's all they can do, uh, because they will not have the support of the United Kingdom anymore. If once Scotland is independent of the UK, the UK has absolutely no sway over what happens in this country anymore, and they will not be allowed to fund these organisations, and I'm pretty certain that the Scottish Secret Services, when they start up, the security services will be all over what's left of uh, loyalist uh, groups and cells in Scotland and making sure that they get no funds from outside of Scotland at all and that they are kept very firmly under scrutiny at all times to make sure they don't cause any more problems. So I think, you know, looking at this logically, we have Joanna Cherry's case, which has got to be held. Uh, in Scots law, even in English court, and Scots law has to be applied to this appeal. For all 11 judges, they have to apply Scottish law to this. They can't use English law on it. And therefore, I think, as Joanna Cherry has said, that we can be cautiously optimistic that they might uphold this appeal, in which case Boris Johnson has to recall Parliament. Otherwise, he will be breaking the law of the land. And I'm talking about the law of this land, Scotland. Um, as for Tompkins and Murdo Fraser, well, these are just the last bitter uh, graspings at straws uh, trying to, <clears throat> to claim that they have some kind of control over the independence referendum. They have none. And finally, hopefully, we will get free from the United Kingdom and its toxic influence and its divisive uh, Orange Order and other organisations which seek to divide Scottish people along these rules religious and sectarian fault lines. They shouldn't exist. Any sectarians left, any um, loyalists who are left who really can't stand living in an independent Scotland should be offered a relocation package to London. Go and live down there, see how you get on. Anyway, that's about it for me today. Um, I'm back again tomorrow. 
uh, in IndyCar and again tomorrow night I'll be presenting Scotland at 7 on Broadcasting Scotland so please tune in tomorrow night as well and please if you can sign up to be a supporter of Broadcasting Scotland we need thousands of supporters because if we can get enough thousands of supporters we will take away all of the license fee from the BBC and uh, if we had say 35,000 um, paying viewers, people who pay £5 a month to watch our programming, we can create 40 jobs and an over 30 hours of unique Scottish uh, programming every single week for that five of the people put in. But we need enough of you to do it. Okay. I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.